Hello and welcome. We acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the many lands on which we live and work and pay our respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty ne has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. EAAA is committed to ensuring equitable and inclusive responses to end elder abuse for people with diverse characteristics and life experiences. We at EAAA honour the older people in our community who have endured abuse and neglect, and we note the important contribution of their lived experience to our work. We at EAAA support the International Convention of the Rights of Older Persons and aspire to a day when everyone can live a life free from abuse. I'm Philippa MacDonald, and this webinar is brought to you by Compass.info and Elder Abuse Action Australia, the EAAA, with funding from the Attorney General's Department. <clears throat> Today, we're talking about who commits elder abuse and why. Some of the issues could be distressing. Please take down this number, the Elder Helpline, 1800 353 374. That number again for the Elder Helpline, 1800 353 374. We've got an incredible panel. Helen Wallace is the Social Work Practice Director at the Caxton Legal Center. Helen has also lived on, El, Helen is also on the board of EAAA and she works with people with lived experience of abuse and neglect. Dr. Rachel Carson is the executive manager of the Elder Abuse Research Team and a senior research fellow or the senior research fellow on elder abuse at the Australian Institute of Family Studies which was responsible for the National Elder Abuse Prevalence Study. And Pip Kaur is a barrister at law. Her doctorate from the University of Oxford focused on the utility and validity of family care agreements and the inherent power imbalances that exist within familial relationships, particularly those involving vulnerable older people and her thesis also focused on elder abuse. Welcome to our panelists and thanks for joining us. We invite you to ask questions in the Q&A. We ask you to be respectful and refrain from identifying anyone and direct your questions to our panelists. Let's start with you, Dr. Rachel Carson. Why is it so important to understand who commits elder abuse? And please, could you walk us through what you found in the prevalence study when it comes to who commits elder abuse? Sure. Thank you, Philippa. Um, better understanding about who commits elder abuse helps older people, it helps service providers and the general community alike to identify elder abuse where it's occurring or where there may be risk of it occurring. And this helps us to act to prevent elder abuse before it occurs or to stop the abuse where it is occurring. And it does this by informing us of the risk factors and the circumstances in which elder abuse is committed and by whom it's committed. And this better understanding is informed by research such as the prevalence data that you mentioned. The knowledge supports us to take the work that's also needed with people who are engaging in elder abuse to better address the risk factors and issues that are affecting those people who are engaging in elder abuse. Um, just taking a step back for a moment, the National Elder Abuse Prevalence Study has established a prevalence estimate of elder abuse among community dwelling older people aged 65 years or older in Australia to be at 15%. And this estimate is based on experiences that were reported in the 12 month period before the survey of 7,000 older people who participated in the study. And when considering these prevalence data, it really is important to consider that these figures are likely to be an underestimate of the total prevalence of elder abuse because they exclude people who lack cognitive capacity to participate or who are living in aged care settings. 
In relation to your more specific question about who commits elder abuse, these prevalence data uh, show us that the predominant relationship dynamic in elder abuse is intergenerational and familial uh, with adult children at 18%, partners of children at 7%, and grandchildren at 4% of the reported perpetrators, and the partners or spouses of older people at 10%, as we can see on the slide here. Friends or acquaintances of older people are at 12% and 9% respectively, and neighbours at 7%. So they're also a significant group. And collectively, this group of family, acquaintances and neighbours are actually only a little bit smaller than the familial intergenerational group. So important to consider in that regard. Yes, that's that's very interesting. 15%, mm -hmm. that's a very big figure. And as you say, uh, you consider it to be an underestimation and um, social connections um, really sort of almost up there with, uh, with family members. Pip Kaur, what are you seeing in your practice as a barrister and some of the behaviours that manifest among those who commit elder abuse. Thanks, Philippa. Yes, in my practice as a barrister, a common scenario of elder abuse involves financial elder abuse that has often been perpetrated by the older person's child and most commonly in circumstances where that adult child is also the attorney under an enduring power of attorney. Um, in most circumstances, um, the attorney has commenced immediately for, for financial purposes, which is then sadly, it can be used as a tool to therefore perpetrate abuse by using their powers under that document. So in my experience, it is more common to see elder abuse against one older parent, not two. Now that might just be anecdotal, Rachel and Helen may have something to say about that. But in, in most circumstances, the older parent is either um, alone because of the death of a spouse, is alone because their spouse has moved into an, a nursing home or an aged care facility. Um, and so therefore, they're more vulnerable um, to abuse because they're often dependent, they're lonely, um, they may have financial needs and care needs. Um, so often in my practice, I tend to see um, things post-death um, which have its own complications and complexities in relation to, to recovering those assets or monies. But the matters that involve um, people who are still alive um, involve circumstances where there was an encouraging or a coercing by that adult child to transfer the older parent's main asset to them, which is often the main home, the family home. And that can come with difficulties because often the older person has lived in that home for, for many, many years, and it's often um, due to the rising housing market, it's often very valuable. Um, so there's often transfers of assets into vivos sleep, so during the lifetime of the older parent. There's also um, circumstances where the older parent is encouraged or coerced to sell that main asset and contribute the sale proceeds towards a bigger home where they all can live in together, or alternatively uh, build a granny flat on the home of the adult child. So... Um, that obviously leaves the older parent vulnerable for financial reasons. They're often left with very little to no um, funds um, and therefore the abuse can begin. Um, in more extreme circumstances, I have seen the sad circumstances where the adult child has installed cameras in the older person's bedroom um, or the older person's granny flat to control what they're doing, um, to control who they're talking to. Um, it may also involve them cutting off their phone services so they can't contact other family members. Um, and it also could involve, after the transfer has been done, um, the, the, the adult child arranges for that older parent to move into a nursing home um, where that adult child then cuts the, the older parent off from other relatives um, so they can't be contacted or visited. Um, that's a more extreme case. but So there's a wide scope of... Um, of abuse scenarios that I see in my practice. And Pip, look, a question's just come through. Do you find in your practice that there is an unconscionable conduct or undue influence in financial elder abuse? Yes, yes, most often. I'm based in Queensland. Now, um, one provision that's only relevant to Queensland is Section 87 of the Powers of Attorney Act, 
which is a um, presumption of undue influence. So that does very much play a role in these transactions. Um, so the starting point for any of those transactions where there's an attorney in place is that that was procured by undue influence. In circumstances where there wasn't a power of attorney involved, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. Actual undue influence is quite difficult to establish. Um, but most often than not, those hallmarks of that type of undue influence and coercion is very present, unfortunately. Pip, thank you so much. Perfect time to go to you, Helen Wallace. Tell us about some of the abuse behaviours your clients are telling you about. Thanks, Philippa. Yes, well, at Caxton Legal Centre here, we've been running a specialist elder abuse service for about 16 years with each client having a social worker and lawyer to work with them. And so we've listened to thousands of seniors over those years. And I can echo that we hear things that Pip has spoken about. And just to go through some of the others, um, seniors are telling us about adult, adult children and grandchildren who move into their home and won't leave when they're asked to. And at times they're also, those unwanted guests are taking over the home eating all the food, leaving possessions everywhere, making it harder to move around the house and so on. Refusing to allow contact with grandchildren or threatening to do that in order to coerce the older person to do something. There's also just adult children assuming they know what's right for the older person and taking over rather than supporting the older person to keep making their own decisions. For example, getting rid of almost all their belongings as a helpful, you know, clean up the house exercise. Um, also, sometimes adult children trying to exclude the stepmother or stepfather and engineering basically a separation of the couple, especially say if one has to go into residential aged care and the adult child who might be the power of attorney insisting that that stepmother not be allowed to visit, things like that. Very, very stressful. And then there's berating, belittling, um, being sworn at and yelled at, being getting the silent treatment, being told repeatedly that the person has dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And then the older person says, they're also saying this to my friends, my other relatives, my GP, and to the point where it becomes really hard for the older person to convince their friends and relatives that no, they don't have dementia, there's no diagnosis. So, you know, it's, it's gaslighting is another term for it. And it also affects their social connections and their isolation. And of course, using the older person's money for themselves, stealing through the, taking their bank cards or doing online transactions that's effectively stealing as well. There's physical abuse like pushing or threatening physical acts. Um, keeping an older person locked up with insufficient care and food in, a, in the more extreme sorts of cases and lots of variations of that granny flat or you know financial contribution gone wrong, even uh, cutting off the electricity to the granny flat. So you know many things can happen and you can see through those few examples that the older person's human rights are being diminished by that this kind of behavior such as their right to continue their decision-making autonomy, which they've probably had their whole life and can continue or can continue with support. Um, even the right to be safe and free from violence, the right to be free from inhuman or degrading treatment, a whole range of rights that older people um, should be able to claim for themselves. Well, you do raise a very important Point about you know really amplifying the human rights aspect of this and and what you've outlined based on the experience of thousands of your clients is very distressing and I would just um, recap on the elder helpline if you're hearing this or you may be affected 1800 353 374 1800 353 
374. We're getting a few questions uh, in the Q&A uh, to do with um, people in um, nursing homes um, and also uh, powers of attorney. And I would like to point people to particularly on powers of attorney, enduring powers of attorney, to the wonderful resources on compass.info and some of our previous webinars that have covered this. So please take a look at compass.info and there will be in the newsletter, which uh, comes out tomorrow, uh, which will accompany this webinar, um, details of where you can get those additional resources. Helen, back to you. Walk us through your research or your findings on the types of perpetrators that your clients are having to endure. Yes, well, um, what we did, Philippa, was we looked at some 2017 research done in Illinois in the US by an adult protective service there who looked at 336 clients and the characteristics of the perpetrators. And uh, we, we looked at that in relation to five or 50 of our closed cases to see if there was a good fit. And actually we found that, um, yes, the, the perpetrator characteristics that our clients were talking about was quite a good fit. And you can see on the slide there that the caregiver type was 22%. Most were the dependent caregivers. There's a temperamental abuser character uh, category and a dangerous abuser category. And I can explain more later as to uh, how those types are defined. But um, I just want to flag that the research wasn't saying that carers are perpetrators and in fact we all know that carers can um, cop abuse themselves but they've used that term caregiver in a very specific way um, so i might just ask you just to pick up there and just give us uh the definition of a dependent caregiver and a caregiver i mean i think i know but just for clarity Yes, so those dependent caregivers, our 38% group, they do provide moderate levels of support to the older person, but they're typically irresponsible, they're opportunistic, and they depend on the older person for money, and they often have unstable employment themselves, and they're most likely to be committing financial abuse. So if you want to work with that sort of uh, abuser, you'd be trying to help them get alternative housing, look at what job training is there for them, how to increase their life skills and their independence. With the caregiver abusers, and again, they're not necessarily carers, um, but they usually do provide some help and support to the older person. The abuse is often unintentional. It could be the result of being overwhelmed or lacking skills or ability or lacking knowledge and neglect and financial abuse were the most common forms of abuse by that perpetrator type. So for that person, uh, that abuser, you'd be ideally offering them support and also education around the certain issues that they're grappling with. You know, it might be financial management skills, for example. So that's how they uh, have been described. And um, and we're going to come to it a little bit later on, but when you talk about the um, supports or the interventions for people suspected of elder abuse, they're a bit thin on the ground, uh, are lacking very much. So we will go to that a little bit later, but but thank you for walking that us through that. And Rachel, uh, how does this concur with your evidence of who commits? elder abuse, the main groups and the types of elder abuse. And I think this also will, uh, with Helen's answer and Pip's later on, uh, really answer one of the questions in the Q&A. Well, um, we've got a very handy slide um, which will present um, the profiles of the, the people who are 
um, committing elder abuse. And we can see from this slide here that the, the prevalence data is really showing us that the profiles of these people committing elder abuse do vary according to the abuse type. And that's similar to um, the data that Helen was just speaking to. So we can see from the slide that um, the only form of abuse in which adult children, however, not strongly implicated uh, is sexual abuse. For that particular type of abuse, sexual abuse, the most common um, people uh, committing that form of abuse are friends at 42% and acquaintances at 13%. Um, and that's um, uh, followed by partners or spouses or neighbor, a neighbor at 9%. Otherwise, as you can see from the slide, children, adult children are the most common um, people committing um, financial abuse at 33%, psychological abuse at 18% and physical abuse at 17%. But you can also see from the slide here that the partners and spouses slightly exceed adult children um, as engaging in neglect at 25% as opposed to 24% for um, adult children. And, and so we have that picture which really is showing financial abuse as the most psychological and financial as the main types of abuse? Uh, well, yes, in the prevalence study in, and in uh, um, obviously not wanting to um, uh, repeat previous webinars, but just as a to clarify, the most common form of abuse is psychological abuse as reported in the prevalence study. And that was at um, 12%. Uh, neglect was the next most common subtype of abuse that was reported and that was at 3%. And the other um, forms of abuse, uh, the prevalence rate were 2% uh, for financial abuse, 2% uh, for physical abuse and 1% for sexual abuse. And so the data that's presented on the slide here shows uh, the, um, the, the people who are committing those forms of abuse and the, um, the, the rate at which they're reported to commit those forms of abuse. Thank you so much. And Pip, can I go to you now? What do some of the power imbalances look like? Yes, thanks, Philippa. I mean, it's very much with what Helen and Rachel were saying, um, the power imbalances, which I most commonly see in my practice, um, exist when there's a vulnerability. Now, vulnerability is a, a broad word because vulnerable is subjective, but but in my, in my scenario, in my practice, <clears throat> the scenario often is where there's an incapacity, so there's failing health um, or, or dementia present or Alzheimer's. Um, but what I'm also seeing is, we know that longer life expectancy, which is something to be celebrated, that's, it's a great thing, um, but it's, it's resulting in the need for more older people to reside in the community for longer. Um, and often that also means living with family members for care. As I said earlier, this may result in um, the fact that there's a reluctance of older people to move into aged care facilities, um, there's and high care needs, there's a death of a spouse, loneliness, financial difficulties, um, there might be remote rural living. They don't want to move into town away from their community. There's lots of scenarios that uh, encourages in the desire for many older people to remain in the community as they age. Um, but that scenario, I think, is resulting in this power imbalance of a caring relationship where the adult child becomes the carer for their parent. And now often that's done in a scenario where that adult child is also caring for their children. So we call them in the literature, the, the sandwich carers. Um, so there's this sort of, and it's often um, females caregivers, which um, I know the statistics show that it's often male sons who perpetrate abuse. Um, but the scenario of this sort of caregiver can often be the female. Um, and, and they're also suffering with their own stresses in life, financial stress, work stress, family stress, marital stress. Um, so I think that can create many power imbalances. This, this sort of the, the, the shift of um, vulnerability goes from the adult child to the older parent. Um, and where there's high care needs, so for example, it could result in the adult child having to shower their older parent. Now I know to many that would sound abhorrent and we wouldn't want that for, for many people, but that is often the reality where people are caring for their older parent 
it's making that older parent very vulnerable to that child. And they therefore rely entirely on them for their daily needs. Everything from waking up, meal preparation, driving around, um, the older parent, as, as, as Helen said earlier, um, when dementia is present or failing eyesight, um, often their driver's license can be restricted, which means that they can't get around the community independently. Um, so they're reliant on their child to take them to the doctor, take them to the dentist, take them to the lawyer. Um, so that power imbalance in that relationship is, is a, common, a common one that I see in my practice. It's also quite common um, where sadly the older parent doesn't want to be a burden on their family. Um, so they're often, they're very reluctant to seek help and they're very reluctant to yell out the, the, the conduct that's happening. Um, so that's one power imbalance that exists in relation to the dynamic between child and parent. I'm interested in that you touched on the sandwich carers, and I know that you've done a lot of research in this. And I just want to pick you up because we're talking about who commits elder abuse. And mm. it's it's not really one dimensional, is it? Because no. that sandwich carer could be supporting mum in the home, maybe living in the home to care for mum, but it might be another member of the family who's actually committing the elder abuse. Exactly, that's right, yes. Can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so it, it, in, um, in my research for my doctorate thesis, so less that I see in my practice, um, this sandwich carer is often um, having to take time off from their work, so they're financially strapped anyway. Um, as I said, it tends to be women. Now, Rachel and Helen might agree with that, but the female carer is therefore um, losing out on their statutory entitlements, so superannuation, um, pay, all of the things that um, you get when you work, obviously, and they're doing it for the love of their parent. So they're doing it without the expectation of reward. Um, and despite that sort of willingness to assist their older parent, it might not be them abusing their parent. It might be another sibling who is also... Um, attorney, for example, as I said earlier, um, or coercing mum and dad in the background, knowing that there's a relationship existing there with one of the siblings, there might be jealousy that arises. And so it, it may not actually be the female caregiver who's the perpetrator, but another sibling or member of the family who's perpetrating that abuse. Um, Yet there could be those assumptions that they're the one taking the, the money ones. or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And, and in fact, from a legal perspective, unfortunately for that adult female in my scenario um, legally that's a very awkward relationship in black and white because it looks like there is a coercive relationship existing I mean they care for their parent they take them to the doctor they provide care for them they live with them so the hallmarks and the indicia of undue influence for example looks like it exists but it may not be existing so sometimes I act for clients who haven't abused their parent and they've acted very kindly and lovingly, um, but it looks suspicious, if, if you know what I mean. And that's the difficulty because the law is so black and white. And so you have the high burden to shift, sometimes overcome those difficulties. Um, and as I said, sometimes when these arguments are coming out post-death of the older parent, it's very difficult because no one keeps receipts, no one keeps diaries. I mean, people do, <laughs> not many. Um, but no one thinks to keep records, which is one of the questions in the Q&A box, in fact, was about what can be done in relation to um, fiduciary obligations. And I think, and, and one person commented on whether there should be more awareness out there of their obligations. And in fact, I couldn't agree more. I think there has to be more education and more awareness around the obligations of attorneys, um, to keeping receipts, do not mix money. Um, they're all obligations that you have as an attorney and no one, it, very rarely do people understand that. And so this mm. innocent abuse that we'll come to, um, innocent in inverted commas, might be just a lack of awareness that they should never have intermingled money. You don't ever intermingle money as an attorney um, and that can be a breach of your obligations. So I think um, AAA and these types of forums are very encouraging for people to try and get that advice early and keep good records and receipt management during that relationship. And look, I'm going to uh, follow, I've got a follow-up question for you, Pip, but I just want to bring Rachel in for any remarks you'd like to make, because I noticed you were nodding, Rachel. Mm. Yes, look, um, uh, there is a, you, you mentioned before, Philippa, a previous um, 
webinar that we had on um, enduring powers of attorney and family agreements. And um, in that discussion, we, we spoke at some length about the importance of uh, awareness, both on the part of the older person and on the part of the uh, power of the person who holds the power of attorney of their obligations. And that awareness as um, as Pip's just been talking about, is really critical to ensuring that there is um, transparency and to prevent um, issues down the track in terms of that um, that potential for abuse to be alleged um, in seemingly innocent circumstances. So, um, yes, I'd encourage people if they're interested, as they appear to be in the chat, to to avail themselves of those resources on the EAAA website and and that that webinar in particular. Yes, because it is different state by state and uh, compass.info has the breakdowns there. So um, obviously there is a big push for nationally recognised enduring powers of attorney. And that is a campaign that EAAA is very much onto. But uh, please take a look. And thanks, Rachel, for drawing that to our attention, because uh, that is a really, really big area where um, those documents can almost weaponize an elder abuser. So just picking up here, Pip, what forms of coercion appear to be common? You talk about innocent creeping abuse right through to the worst kinds, and you've highlighted it about people having even CCTV, mm. um, cutting off electricity, cutting off phones, um, you know, isolating the mm. older person. Uh, mm. So... Yes, I mean, I think Helen touched upon this earlier in relation to shopping for the older parent. So it could be as innocent as mum or dad say, here, Pip, buy your son a present. And I think my son, I think mum would love to buy my son a $100 toy, but in fact, mum would only like to buy a $20 toy. Um, that could be an innocent misuse of your powers or, or, the cons or the relationship that exists. Another one that's commonly talked about is where um, an adult child goes shopping for the parent using their bank card, um, but just decides to chuck a few more groceries in the basket for themselves. Now that might only be $50, but strictly speaking, that was not consented to by the older parent, so just shouldn't really be done. So that, that's more innocent, if you'd like, um, types of abuse. And ones where I probably wouldn't see it at my at a barrister level, but, but the uh, it can obviously then extend to the more serious types of abuse, which I've spoken to, is is the intergenerational significant transfers of wealth, um, using the bank, you're controlling bank accounts, exploiting mum or dad by giving them an, a weekly allowance. Um, you know, it can be as significant as transferring the main asset to themselves during the lifetime, um, which also can own sometimes, and actually quite commonly in my practice, is only ever discovered post-death because siblings don't really talk about this. In Australia, I find we don't talk about money well. <laughs> um, we don't talk about death at all. We don't talk about illness much. Um, it's very rare for our families to sit around a table and talk about who's getting the couch and who's getting the piano. I think if you have a, if you have a family, um, you know, sad, if you have a, a situation in your family that you've, done, you've dealt with elder abuse or a fight over it, you tend to be more open about these discussions, but it tends not to come out of uh, post-death. So I then, that's where I sort of become more involved trying to recover monies by, by perpetrators of abuse, which is often very difficult because sometimes the money's been spent. It's expensive to trace money. Um, and so it is really an awful and terrible reality that we're living in in relation to the scope of abuse and how we can redress those issues. Helen, when we look at the subtypes, what does it tell you about dependent caregivers and caregivers and types of abuse? Could we just get a, a bit of a drill down there? Because um, this is coming up in the Q&A. People want to know, um, and we've touched on it already, but uh, I've just, with the types of abuse, who are the likely perpetrators? Yeah, so we've, we've got a slide, I think, that describes some of those perpetrator behaviours. So, for example, in this story, a daughter invited her mum to move into state to Queensland to be closer to her with the idea that she'd be supporting her as she aged. And the daughter promised to help buy her mother a unit. And on the under that understanding, the mum transferred money to the daughter 
and the daughter used some of that money towards purchasing a unit, but she also gambled $100,000 of that money away. And mm -hmm. uh, this was a total shock to our client and caused her a lot of anxiety and really a, a post-traumatic kind of anxiety for years. Initially, the daughter repaid half of the money she'd taken, but eventually stopped making repayments when she lost her job and became estranged. So the daughter fits the dependent caregiver type in that she was opportunistic. She was uh, irresponsible. She did provide moderate levels of support with the practicalities early on, but she was financially abusive and that's the most typical of the dependent caregiver. So we did succeed in having the daughter recommence the, some nominal repayments and our social worker connected the client to some affordable long-term counselling after she'd struggled to be able to afford that. And we used our special bequest fund here at Caxton um, to pay for some overdue body corporate fees for this person. And legally, we achieved a good outcome. Um, and, you know, the lady was connected to more supports so that her independence increased again. But her basic human right to maintain the highest possible standard of mental and physical health remains uh, impacted really. So, um, you know, she's continuing, continues to be estranged from the daughter, which is a never ending source of distress for her. But if we'd um, had the ability as highlighted with the Illinois research about the perpetrator types to have someone intervene with that daughter. It could have focused on things like her gambling addiction and you know, encouraging her to get on top of that. It could have focused on helping that daughter increase her own independence and her job skills. So yeah, that's, that's one of the stories that highlights that dependent caregiver scenario. Do you want me to talk about the caregiver? I think that would be too? very constructive, yes. So in this story, again, it's a de-identified story. The client's daughter helped the older per mother to move into residential aged care after she'd had a stroke. And the daughter, who was also her power of attorney, sold her car for her and some belongings, kept the pet, kept some of the furniture. But um, our client improved a lot in rehabilitation and she wanted to return home but the daughter kept referring back to the original aged care assessment team of showing the client as having very high needs and ignoring the older person's insistence that she was now much more capable. And the daughter disagreed with the mother's wishes and threatened to sue the nursing home and the government and threatened to withhold the mother's bank cards and her pet. So, our client was reassessed and found to be quite capable of independent living with some in-home supports. And so the client felt she had to then revoke the daughter's power of attorney. The client moved back into the rental owned by a relative and resumed her quite rich social life, including contact with adult grandchildren. There were no in-home services available through our aged care system. So the client had to make do with informal help for quite a while while waiting for services to commence. And the client really said she thought her daughter just went overboard in the exercise of her power of attorney and acted as if the mum had dementia, which of course she didn't. Um, the client didn't want legal action taken to get her property back and felt confident that over time, um, re contact with her daughter would resume. So again, it, the big gap to me in terms of who's committing elder abuse was that there was no upfront education for that daughter about her obligations and responsibilities as an attorney. And the daughter had made huge assumptions which may have been prevented. And there was also no service 
to follow up with that daughter to discuss, you know, assistance for a reconciliation with the mum or talk about the return of her mum's belongings. So again, that that specific um, service to engage with abusers was missing. As a legal centre, we're obliged to focus on the rights of our clients and their instructions as to what they want us to do in their best interests. So, mm. you know, that's what we did, but it's not happily ever after necessarily. Mm. And of course, every situation is unique and every abuser is unique and every person who's being abused is quite unique as well. And I think your service, the Caxton Legal Centre, is quite unique in terms of having uh, that holistic approach for your clients from a social worker, financial counsellor, uh, a lawyer. So to be able to um, to ensure that that woman got a second chance, uh, that she could resume her life. And, um, and I, I think you raised an interesting point, and that is that uh, the de-identified client you've just spoken about, she had to revoke her power of attorney. Um, so I might just have a quick word from anyone who would like to sort of say that, that uh, just because you've given your power of attorney to someone doesn't mean it's for the rest of your life, does it? No, that's Again. right. You, yeah. You can revoke that that power and um, and rethink who is it who you trust, I always say 120% to make or support you in decisions um, and in your best interests. I, Pip, I, would you I like agree. to say something there? Yeah. Yes, no, I agree. It's important for everyone to know that this is not set in stone. You can, um, it's, you know, it's like a will. You, you, once you've written a will, you can change your mind before you pass away or, or lose capacity. But as sort of Helen touched on, it can be a problem when someone alleges incapacity and then they get so hurt by that that they want to revoke the attorney because they can't believe their child or friend is alleging that they don't have capacity. Then there's a question as to whether they have capacity to revoke the attorney. And that can involve a big protracted in, you know, debate around validity, capacity, and often we have to go off to QCAT, which is the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal. Um, you know, sometimes you have to have a fight about Firstly, whether mum or dad has capacity, which can be an awful experience for everyone involved. If if you have capacity, trying to defend that is 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 awful. Um, and then secondly, trying to say that the uh, revocation of an of a enduring power of attorney is also valid. So um, it's not the end answer, but it's definitely important to remember that you can get advice in relation to revocation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And look, thank you. And we've got some questions in the Q&A about the slides because the slides are terrific. Thank you, everyone. And they will be available uh, in our follow-up correspondence, our follow-up email with the link to this webinar, the slides to this webinar and the information. And, uh, and look, this is uh, the perfect time to come back to you, Rachel, because Helen picked up on some of the traits of uh, dependent uh caregivers who go on to perpetrate elder abuse. We're not saying well, it's only a small fraction of them, but gambling was one aspect. Um, where's mental illness? Where's gambling? Uh, what are some of the um, factors uh, that you would identify or the circumstances of those people who do commit or some of those people who do commit elder abuse? So the prevalence study does also indicate that um, people committing elder abuse reported a range of problems according to the participants who reported that they'd experienced that abuse. And most commonly, um, people committing elder abuse were reported to have um, mental health problems, almost one third of people committing elder abuse um, that applied to, and financial problems, nearly one in five people committing elder abuse that was reported to apply to them. Um, not unexpectedly, the most common problems experienced um, uh, by people who committed financial abuse were financial problems. Um, mental health issues were most commonly reported 
problems for people who are committing physical and psychological abuse. And for sexual abuse, alcohol problems predominated the people using that form of abuse. Neglect uh, is, is different from the other abuse subtypes with um, physical health problems being the most common issue that was associated with people who reported to have engaged in neglectful behaviour. Mm. So uh, mental health, financial problems, alcohol um, can be some of the social contexts uh, associated right. with people who commit elder abuse. That's right. So um, the those are the experiences that perpetrators were reported to have been experiencing um, by those who uh, indicated that they had experienced the elder abuse by those people. Look, thank you. And in the Q&A, uh, we've got uh, a number of people asking for stats on how many abusers are convicted and what the penalty was. We have touched on this in some of our other webinars. Um, we are still uh, uh, looking um, and investigating the best available data there through uh, the police services of every state and territory and um, the public prosecutions. But if anyone on our panel has anything to contribute there, um, please do. Um, I, I would just say that the National Elder Risk Prevalence Study has limited insight in, in that regard, um, uh, but um, certainly the efforts that you've noted that AAA are looking into would um, provide, you know, certainly there's a dearth of research and information about, about that too, so those efforts that AAA are engaging in to identify data on that front would be very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I think that Helen, you have spoken about so many of your clients where there would have been opportunities if the services were available to identify the, uh, the perpetrator's behaviour and in some way intervene. Um, what options do we have in Australia to address the perpetrators and prevent a lot of abuse? Yeah, that's a... A tricky question in a way. Philippa, it's a very because, big one. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there are community services, for example, alcohol and drug services, gambling services. There are initiatives within police forces in different parts of Australia. There's law reform efforts. There's um, a whole lot of education going on within our health systems. So, it's a bit of a bumpy patchwork across Australia as to the initiatives that are underway and, and you know, others like in Queensland where we, where we have um, the multidisciplinary elder abuse specialist services in, run by six different organisations covering almost the whole of Queensland. Um, but they are not necessarily focused on those committing elder abuse. So I think this could be a, a real emphasis in the next national plan to prevent abuse of older Australians. It could be something that we work on in state and territory jurisdictions to try to get some greater research, greater practice trials around effectively intervening and engaging with these people who are abusing. So, you know, some of them might be fairly extreme, that dangerous abuser type, as, as we coined the term, where you really need to separate them from the older person as quickly as possible, where you might re rely on the law and domestic and family violence legislation, for example, to achieve that. But there's a whole range of other um, less drastic forms of intervention that could be happening in Australia. So, um, you know, I could have a client who's effectively locking herself in her bedroom most of the day and most of the night to avoid any interaction with the abusive family member in her home, which, of course, is devastating for that older person. But there's no one I can ring to say, can you get to this address and knock on the door and have a good go at um, offering some 
support and intervention to that relative. Mm. Um, you know, it's a big gap. Mm. And look, again, I would um, I would draw people's attention to the elder helpline. So if you're in a situation like that, it would be 1800 353 374, or you just want to have someone to talk to that this has been distressing. And, um, you know, in terms of like, there's some interest in the Q&A about profiling, and we have had kind of profiles of of the of who commits elder abuse and the types of elder abuse that they're committing and someone here is saying that uh, they feel greed is a big motivation and this is something that we covered a couple of webinars uh, ago in terms of inheritance impatience or whatever you want to call it some people find that a very um, negative term to something which is a uh, theft um, on a, a very very big scale but Pip in your experience what can be done and when you're dealing with a perpetrator, well, you're not really dealing with the perpetrator, but when you have contact in the um, legal process with a perpetrator through med mediation or whatever, who has been caught out, are you seeing much remorse? What kind of traits are you seeing? Mm -hmm. Yes, sadly, Philippa, um, in my experience, the perpetrators who I've met, and I must say, I don't tend to meet them because of obviously, as a barrister, it's I'm one step removed from the actual perpetrator. Um, but in the sort of few times I've experienced direct contact is they often show very um, little to no remorse. And in fact, they vehemently defend their position. Um, they will spend lots of money and lots of time on protracted litigation to prove that they were right um, and swear black and blue that it you know, mum and dad told me to do this, I was acting on instruction. And it typically tends to be that there was no instruction and it might have just been their view that there was those instructions or consent. So that might, it might not be fair to call them sort of narcissistic traits or um, greedy perpetrators, but it tends to be a common sort of scenario where um, by the time I'm involved, there's often very staunch views that one was right and one was wrong. Um, with very little in between. Um, in relation to what can be done, I think we've all touched upon it. Um, and in my PhD, I grappled with this because obviously I had to conclude what can be done to ameliorate abuse. And I don't think necessarily the law is just the answer. I think it's an education and an awareness um, for lots of interdisciplinary meetings and meeting of the minds to work out how we tackle this issue. Um, I've noticed a few comments in the Q and A's. Well. Does, does sort of legislation solve the problem, particularly around granny flood agreements? Now, my personal opinion on that is I've looked at that on my, in my doctorate and um, it may not, it may, it may help, it, but it, you, we can't legislate for the one scenario because as, as is evident today, as Helen said, every abuser is different, every, every victim is different. So trying to set out a regime in black and white, I don't think sadly will solve all of the problems that we're talking about. Um, so in closing, sort of my feedback would be, I encourage, I know it's expensive. Um, there are great services out there like Caxton and great services out there that are less expensive, but I would very much encourage everyone, whether you're elderly or not elderly to get good legal advice early and independent financial advice early before making big decisions in relation to transferring of wealth. Um, $500 today will save you a whole lot more money in 10, 20 years. So um, that's one thing that we could do to encourage people understanding their rights. Um, also, it's a bit of a separate discussion, but understanding your rights around advanced health directives and wills. So there's not just endure, enduring documents uh, are varied um, and very state specific. So if you're moving states or territories, um, you need to sort of think about are your affairs in order? Who would you like your attorney to be? when that would attorney would be invoked um, jointly. You know, there's lots of big decisions to make. It's not as simple as just ticking a box and hoping one day it won't ever be used. Um, so if one thing you do today from this discussion is get advice on those documents, I've, I've, had a good, we've had, we've had a good impact on people's lives. Thank you so much, Pip. And um, I, I think that, you know, there is certainly a call to action. I'm just going to ask some, just drawing out of something from the Q&A, 
Um, and I, I know that we have touched on this, but I'm just going to ask uh, each of you just to give us one thing that you think might be a sign, a, 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 a the, this anonymous attendee saying a, a, a sign of signs of preceding elder abuse that an individual is likely to commit elder abuse and what might be the family circumstances. So if I could just have one thought from each of you about what might be a preceding sign of elder abuse? Oh, that's tough. Um, Rachel, you take the floor. I, I was just going to say that I think um, uh, taking note of whether an older person is becoming more socially isolated and withdrawn from their usual activities, um, that can, can um, often be... Um, a factor that's identified or a risk factor to, to elder abuse. So um, those social connections and, and keeping up those usual activities that an older person might be engaged in, um, watching out for that, um, I think would be, would be um, a, a critical, um, critical uh, sign. Um, but of course, um, uh, more obvious um, uh, Telltale, sign, telltale signs could be a person's physical appearance, um, whether there are whether there are um, abnormalities in that regard, um, and whether a person is distressed and demonstrating distress about um, uh, experiences that they're having with um, the potential abuser. So, mm, sorry, that was not one. <laughs> oh, that's that's wonderful, Helen. Would you like to make a remark there? Well, Rachel's covered a very important aspect. Um, I think maybe on the financial side, because if, you know, with ageing and physical frailty, help with finances might be one of the first things you start to be, depend on others for. But if the older person's not really clear about what's happening with their finances or there's unusual and overly generous looking transactions, or you know, giving away large amounts of money or cars and things like that, that might be an outward sign that something untoward is happening. Mm. And I think I'll, we're going to calling it out as well. I mean, how do you call out these signs of what is likely to be elder abuse? How do you call it out and what kind of... Um, you know, Rachel, what do you see as the priorities for community education and action? So the prevalence research really does identify the importance of developing an evidence-based prevention framework and key areas of focus for a strategy like that could be increasing that recognition and awareness of elder abuse behaviours. Um, so in addition to socio-demographic characteristics associated with elder abuse and the sorts of things we've been talking about today, like financial strain, housing stress, um, other characteristics um, such as mental ill health, poor physical health, um, these could provide some directions in terms of a framework. The fact that elder abuse takes place in family relationships and in social contexts um, means that measures to address this need to manage um, potential adverse consequences for victims, as Helen was mentioning before, such as that isolation from their family and friends. So awareness of um, awareness raising really needs to be part of a set of strategies that are intended to improve identification of and responses to elder abuse, both in the community and service settings. So some proactive mechanisms to identify people who are experiencing, or experiencing an abuse are important, together with services and supports to respond to elder abuse where it's occurring. So it might, um, it might be, for example, that there's an important role for family and friends to play as confidants um, for people who are experiencing abuse. Um, and we need some strategies to target the general public um, and as well as those who work with older people or come in regular contact with older people about what to do to respond. And they could be um, systematic screening responses for professionals um, in health settings and more generally having those elder abuse service providers and safeguarding units available to um, uh, as options when considering these strategies also. 
Look, thank you. Uh, we've got to wrap up now, and I'm really sorry because I'd love to get back to um, Helen and Pip for their comments. But thank you, Rachel, and thank you to everyone who joined in the Q&A, which has been hugely lively. We would love to uh, deliver a lot of those resources to you uh, tomorrow and also on the compass.info website. So thank you. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of you. Um, in Closing, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for joining this webinar. A big thank you to Pip, to Helen and to Rachel and AAA and Compass. A reminder that if this has raised any issues for you, call the Elder Helpline, 1800 353 374. Thank you so much. I'm Philippa McDonald. Goodbye.